Hey guys, I'm your host Jose and welcome to the RPO, where each week I'll be previewing and analyzing the upcoming games for your local New York Jets, New York Giants, plus the three other nationally televised games of the week. To start off week eight, the Atlanta Falcons take on the Carolina Panthers for their second time this season. The Panthers come in riding off of a narrow 27 to 24 defeat to the Saints. Even though the Panthers score the eighth fewest points per game, Teddy Bridgewater and receivers DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson have had decent seasons up to this point. Bridgewater is currently fifth in total passing yards with 1,900 yards, and in their previous encounter, Bridgewater was able to put up 313 passing yards with two touchdowns and a 75% completion percentage in their Week 5 win against Atlanta. Meanwhile, receivers Anderson and Moore are second and seventh in receiving yards, with Anderson having 640 receiving yards and one touchdown, and Moore having 567 receiving yards and three touchdowns. Against Atlanta, the two were able to torch the Atlanta secondary, as they combined for 12 receptions for 205 yards and a touchdown. On defense, there's really no standout performance for the Panthers. They are a pretty middle-of-the-pack defense, as they're 13th in the league in total yards allowed per game and points allowed per game but they are a top 10 defense against the pass this season, allowing only 227 passing yards per game. The Falcons have had as bad of a start to the 2020 season that anyone can probably ask for, as they sit at a 1-6 record and fired former head coach Dan Quinn after their 0-5 start. The major issue with the Falcons is that they have a high-powered offense, but a lackluster defense that hasn't been able to close out games. Matt Ryan is second in the league in passing yards with 2,181 yards, and he's also been fairly efficient with the ball as he has 12 touchdowns to only three interceptions this year. Third year receiver Calvin Ridley is having a breakout season as he's third in the league in receiving yards and receiving touchdowns as he has 615 receiving yards and six touchdowns. Free agent signing Todd Gurley has also been having a terrific season as he's six in rushing yards with 485 and he's tied for the league in rushing touchdowns with seven. But as mentioned earlier, their defense has been the issue as they have the second worst defense in the league as they've allowed the second most total yards per game, allowing 425, and they've also allowed the seventh most points per game as they've allowed 29.6 points. I think the Panthers pull out the win and sweep the season series with a final score of 28 to 20. The Jets continue their winless ways last week with a 18 to 10 loss to the Bills. And hopes for them getting their first win this week are very slim, as they have to take on Patrick Mahomes and the 6-1 Kansas City Chiefs. Although they lost, the Jets didn't look half decent last week, and they came out the gates looking pretty good. In the second quarter, running back Michael P. Ryan scored the game's only touchdown with a 5-yard rush. Then from there, things went pretty downhill as the Bills scored 18 unanswered points to pull out the win. Although Sam Darnold returned to end the spell of the Joe Flacco show, the offense still struggled mightily. Donald finished the day 12 of 23 with only 120 yards and two interceptions, and the team as a whole finished with only 191 yards on offense. On defense, the Jets didn't look that bad. Even though the Bills were able to drive down the field for most of the game, the Jets' defense held firm once they were in their own half, forcing the Bills to attempt eight field goals, only making six of them, and they didn't allow a single touchdown on the day. So even though it was yet another loss, the defense can give the Jets fans hope. Maybe. <laughs> The Chiefs come into this week sitting at an AFC West best 6-1 and and just put a 43-16 linking on the Broncos. The Chiefs are once again bolstered by their high-powered offense, led by Patrick Mahomes and his plethora of offensive weapons, including the likes of Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Nico Hardman, Le'Veon Bell, and rookie running back Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Mahomes is having yet another great season, as he's 7th in passing yards with 1,899 yards, and he has the best touchdown interception ratio in the league as he's thrown for 16 touchdowns and only one interception. In the run game, they've been led by rookie running back Clyde Edwards-Alaire as he has the second most rushing yards in the league with 551. Plus, watch out for new acquisition Le'Veon Bell to put on a show to prove that the Jets misused him in his time in New York. On defense, the Chiefs have been solid as they have the fourth best defense against the pass but also the third worst defense against the run. So it's really a balancing act with the Chiefs defense. But in all regards, I'm still siding with the Chiefs to take this one out, 38 to 10. For the second straight week, we have a bonus game since the Giants play on Monday night this week. In America's game of the week, the 49ers take on the Seahawks at CenturyLink. The Seahawks lost their first game of the season last week in a close 37 to 34 loss in overtime to the Cardinals. Seattle continued their poor defensive play as they allowed Kyler Murray to tear them to shreds. As he finished the day with 360 passing yards, three passing touchdowns, and on the ground, he had 67 rushing yards and a touchdown. 
add another bad defensive performance to a day where Russell Wilson threw three touchdowns, but also made many mistakes throwing three interceptions, and you get your first loss of the season as a result. But Seattle did make strides to beef up their defense this week as they traded for the veteran pass rusher from the Bengals, Carlos Dunlap. This move will give the Seahawks the edge threat that they really don't have as they only have nine sacks on the season, and that's seventh worst in the league. Plus, they do have the best offense in the league as they lead the league in yards per game and points scored per game, so I don't think Pete Carroll is really worried about his squad just yet. The 49ers had an impressive outing against the Patriots last week as they won 33-6 and are finally over the 500 mark as they're now 4-3. The 49ers are looking a little bit shaky for a portion of the season as they lost defensive starters Nick Bosa and Solomon Thomas for the season due to injury and after that had an embarrassing 43-17 loss to the Dolphins and were sitting at 2-3 a couple weeks ago. But after back-to-back -back impressive performances against the Rams and the Patriots, they now sit at 4-3 and, and ready to get back into the race for the NFC West. Even though the Niners lost notable starters on defense, they've been a top-tier unit this season still, as they have the 5th best defense in the league allowing only 309 yards per game and the 3rd best passing defense allowing only 203 passing yards per game. A top performer in their defense has been middle linebacker Fred Warner, as he has 57 tackles and 2 interceptions on the season. With that said, I'm still siding with the Seahawks, with a final score of 24-21. to On Sunday night, the Dallas Cowboys traveled to Lincoln Financial Field to take on the Eagles in a pivotal NFC East matchup. The Eagles proved me wrong and beat the Giants last week for their second win of the season. The Eagles came alive with 4 minutes left in the 4th quarter to erase a 9 point deficit and pull off the slim 1 point victory. Carson Wentz had a good performance throwing for 359 yards and 2 touchdowns, including the go ahead touchdown pass with 40 seconds left, but he did have 1 interception. Backup running back Boston Scott led the way on the ground with 46 rushing yards and he also snagged in that go ahead touchdown pass. In the receiving game, third string tight end Richard Rodgers led the team in receiving yards with 6 receptions for 85 yards. On defense, the Eagles had a pretty okay showing, but they got the job done when it mattered most, as they were able to hold the Giants offense at bay in the fourth quarter, and on the last drive of the game, they were able to strip sack Daniel Jones to seal their victory. The Cowboys entered the game off the back of a crushing 25-3 loss to the Washington football team. The Cowboys do have the third best offense in the league, but ever since Dak Prescott's gruesome season-ending ankle injury, the offense has been less than subpar. With Andy Dolan at the helm, the Cowboys have only put up 13 total points in their past two games. And with Dalton currently going through concussion protocol, they might have to turn to 7th round James Madison product Ben DiNucci to start the game this Sunday. With that gone, the Cowboys have needed star running back Ezekiel Elliott to step up, but that just hasn't happened, as Elliott has only 94 yards and 2 fumbles to show for it in the past two games. The sputtering offense also doesn't provide any help to one of the worst defensive units in the league as the Cowboys are giving up the most points per game, allowing 34.7 points, and are also the league's worst rush defense, allowing 178 rushing yards per game. Due to this, I think the Eagles pull off back-to-back -back wins, as they're going to take this one with a final score of 24-10. to The Giants put an end to Week 8 when Tom Brady and the Buccaneers come into town to take on Daniel Jones and the G-Men on Monday night. The Giants let me down last week, as I picked them to pull off the win against the Eagles, and they almost proved me right. But as in recent Giants fashion, almost is the key word. Once again, Daniel Jones wasn't only the leading passer for the game, but was also the Giants' leading rusher, as he finished the night with 187 passing yards and two touchdowns, and 92 rushing yards. Jones had a decent performance, but he also threw an interception and fumbled the ball on the final drive of the game. But to be honest, most people will only remember Jones' incredible 80-yard run where he was running faster than his body could handle and ended up with him being across memes all over social media as he fell face first into the turf with no one around him, preventing him from capping off the rush with a touchdown. Other than that, Sterling Shepard led the team in receiving yards with 59 and he holding the touchdown as well. And on defense, James Bradbury got an interception for the second straight week. And the Giants were able to get after Carson Wentz, sacking him three times and having 10 QB hits. But in the end, it wasn't enough as they ultimately weren't able to get the stops when it counted the most, which resulted in their loss. The Buccaneers were able to back my pickup last week as they handled business against the Raiders as they won 45-20. The Buccaneers had an impressive fourth quarter against the Raiders where they outscored them 21-3 to seal the victory. 
Brady went 33 for 45 for 369 passing yards and four touchdowns in what was his best performance of the season. Receiver Scotty Miller led the way in receiving yards as he had six receptions for 109 yards and a touchdown. On the ground, the Buccaneers had 85 yards with Leonard Fournette leading the way with 50. On defense, the Buccaneers were led by second-year linebacker Devin White as he finished the day with 11 tackles, 3 sacks, and 3 TFLs, which was good enough to get him named NFC Defensive Player of the Week. Plus, rookie free safety Antoine Winfield Jr. also got his first interception of his career. With all that said, I'm going with the Bucks this week with a final score of 35-7. to And those are my five picks for this week. Tune in to the RPO next week to see what my picks are for week nine.